Welcome to the Medical Muse podcast. Discover the humanistic aspects of physicians and scientists as they describe their career paths and any advice they have for current medical students. Each episode, we interview a new guest and discuss the future of the field. This is the Medical Muse. Okay, well, welcome to the show, Dr. Clark. We really appreciate you finding the time to talk to us today. I know I heard an interview with you on a different podcast one time, and I've been so excited to hopefully get to talk to you in the future ever since then. Um, so to start, do you want to go ahead and just tell us a little bit about yourself? <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. I was born at a very early age. So I'm a, I'm a uh, you know, I'm one of the, you know, the after World War II, uh, there were a lot of kids born. And so I would say I was kind of in the middle of the baby boom era, you know, and uh, um, that was a very uh, interesting time because so much was changing in our society. You know, you had women coming off of out of World War II who now had a more active role in the workforce and, um, uh, you know, all these uh, folks were coming back from from war and they were having to get jobs and everything. And it was a very, uh, it was, you know, it was a very uh, transitional period in, in our country. Um, and uh, for me, it was, and it was interesting because I was the oldest. So the, I was the, I was the kind of training model that our, my parents had to deal with. And, you know, it was, you know, a lot, it was very heavy on discipline and, uh, uh, you know, control, and, and I, I actively resisted that uh, throughout my, uh, you know, upbringing. In fact, I was kind of a rebellious kid, and I inspired that in my brother, and I often thought, you know, I was, I was in trouble a lot. I was a bad kid, and I actually thought, man, I'm a poster child for Planned Parenthood, because I don't know why my parents had any more after me, because I, I was a handful. Yeah. How many brothers and sisters do you have? So I have a, a, a my my next uh, you know closest uh, is my brother who is a, three years younger than me, and that was pretty much every three years. It seemed like it must have been the, my father's deployment cycle, you know, when we when they had kids. So, and they they kept having them until they had two girls, and the girls were the good good kids in our family, and the boys were the bad ones. Yep, always so, out there causing ruckus yeah. around the neighborhood. <laughs> That's hilarious. And then you ended up going to, towards the Navy route, which, you know, was very, very disciplined. So um, that's funny how, you know, you made that transition, uh, you know, with your personality at an early age. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, in some ways, it kind of gave me the discipline that I probably needed. Otherwise, I'd have been, you know, hot and heavy in the hippie culture and, you know, <laughs> free love and all that stuff. But um yeah, so I, um, my dad was a career military officer. He started as a private in the end of World War II and, and, and went to officer candidate school and then advanced through that rank. And it was, it was unusual for somebody to start out as a private and make colonel. So, um, but he was a very strict, strict disciplinarian. And my mom was kind of more the loving one in the family. Uh, and we, um, we, we, we had a, a, a life that was to me to me I looked at it like adventure because we were always moving and um the military is a, is kind of a strange was a strange organization they didn't really have a huge um uh effort geared towards the family so you were just basically accoutrements for your the 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 the, the husband it was it was also very there were women in the military but not as not as many as there are now thank goodness there's you know been a branching out and having more women but you know at the time it was kind of like your standard kind of thing the the, the father was the home uh, the the breadwinner and the mother was the homemaker and um we moved we moved so many times i think my brother calculated we moved i think 20 times in 18 years. I remember I had six first grades. I mean, who moves that much? Oh, wow. And besides it, moving is expensive, you know, and, and uh, the military didn't pay for very much. So I remember most of the time we would just camp across the country. And then every fourth or fifth day, we'd stay in a hotel, a motel, you know, 
uh, and and then camp the rest of the way. So that's how we would we would make it back and forth across the country. And the military had schools in all these different places. So my dad would be going to some some training uh, school somewhere, and we would just move along. Occasionally, we had a, a grandmother on the east coast and a grandmother on the west coast. So depending on where we were, we would end up staying with them a lot of the time. But it was a very nomadic lifestyle. And um, but at the same time, you know, as a as a kid growing up in the, you know, uh, post war years in the space age, it was kind of cool, you know, because you just got exposed to everything, and and including I lived a lot overseas. And um, uh, my dad was an army officer and it, his, his main um, branch was an armor, which was the tanks. And that was the main what, mainstay for um, the Cold War in, in Europe, you know. And, and back then there was an East and West Germany. So it was split. And we had, uh, uh, you know, we would be stationed along the border on these units that would be very quickly overrun if the Soviets came through. And uh, we would be always trained on how to get out if, the, if that happened, you know, so we were trained to get everything into your car and with moments notice and start driving, you know, west to like, say, Holland or somewhere. Mm -hmm. If the, if the, you know, if the balloon went up, so to speak. Um, and as a result, it was, it was a fascinating experience. And we, we were always seeing something new. And what I really remember vividly in, and this was post-war Europe. And, you know, I was born eight years after the end of World War II. And, um, and in, the, in the late 50s and early 60s, post-war Germany, uh, which was West Germany at the time, was still heavily bombed out and damaged. And I remember seeing just, you know, this carnage, even though there was, the streets were you know, back and cleared and they, the rail system was up and running, it was still a very uh, decimated place. Uh, and people were living in really abject poverty. Um, and it was a very, it had a, it had a profound effect on me. I, I think it, 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 it created a little more passion in me that realized, to make me realize how, how much that you think you don't have and then you see how somebody else lives and then you go, wow. You know, I should quit complaining because these people have it a lot worse than me. So it was a, it was a, an experience that uh, you know fortified my adventuresome, curious nature. Um, and I, I remember uh, my brother and I um, we kind of describe ourselves as uh, free range children. You know, because when we would come home from school. And we would just be on our own until dinner time, you know, which was when it got dark. And so my brother and I, especially in, in Europe, can you imagine? I mean, we had all this stuff to go explore. So we were off in the woods and we would go for miles exploring stuff. And we would find old wrecks of, you know, German equipment and 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 stuff like that and, and would be playing with stuff and and uh so it was a it was a it was a great experience. I enjoyed it uh, because I had no supervision and I could play and uh, do stuff like that, vir virtually un um, you know um, untethered. Did, so did that's that, how your mind became a little bit more curious, and you were able to explore the things you wanted to, or how did you finally make your way into science? Well, I mean, I was actually, uh, I was, yeah, I think it was, it was a, it was a, it was a, uh, a, ra a rabid curiosity. I mean, everything was interesting. You know, there was, uh, wherever we were at the time, you know, you kind of uh, explore the local uh, 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 geography and the, the culture. And, and so I got exposed to foreign cultures overseas and, uh, and was fascinated by the diversity of it. And, um, and so even though I went into medicine, I have a lot of other you know, interests in different things. And mostly it's about, um, I really enjoy people and different cultures. And so um, I was really lucky to get that exposure. For example, um, you know, I mean, when I was in, in school, I mean, I moved every year of high school. So, you know, no, nothing was constant there. And high school was a time when you 
kind of, you know, build a lot of your early personality. And so, you know, it was, you know, kind of a challenge when you're moving every year. Um, my dad went to Vietnam in 67. And that would have been, I think uh, I was a, 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 um, a sophomore. And so he left and he was gone for two years. So I didn't see him, which was kind of good in some ways, because he was a very strict person. And so I got more free reign during my kind of more rambunctious years. And, you know, I did get into some trouble, you know, I mean, like uh, any kid at the time. Um, and I think that the being at getting in trouble kind of made me realize I better get something, you know, serious or more focused. So instead of focusing on, you know, doing devilish things, I would do things like, you know, science projects. And so I, I got I got to go scuba diving at an early age and um, and loved uh, being underwater was like this total freedom. So I, it, I pursued that for, you know, and it's still do very interested in, you know, the um, oceans and undersea environment. And, uh, and years later, I got to go do that in the Navy, which was really cool. And I also got to fly uh, at a young age as a teenager. Uh, when we were in Germany, um, one of the things I got to do is to go fly gliders. And uh, gliders are a really great way to start learning to fly because, you know, you don't have an engine. So you have everything is about what they call stick and rudder. You know, it's your, your ability to judge where, where you are. You're always in an engine out scenario and you're going to land somewhere. So you better be constantly thinking about how you land, where the wind is, you know, where the obstacles are, that kind of stuff. And to make matters more challenging, it was right on the East German border. And so if you got it wrong and you went over the border, you would be in deep trouble. Oh, wow. So, um, and the pilots that were the, our instructors, it was a German glider school and it's a pretty well-known glider school. And they were all old Luftwaffe pilots, you know, and they'd have a stick and they'd sit behind you and tap on your head or your shoulders, you know and links or X, you know, and, and uh, pull up this, this, that, and the other thing uh, in German. And so, you know, uh, I mean, what a great experience to fly, you know, unpowered aircraft being taught by former Luftwaffe pilots. And it's an interesting story, but in post-World War I era, the Treaty of Versailles restricted the Germans from having a lot of powered aircraft. So they decided to break the rules, but they trained all their pilots initially on gliders in that very glider school. And so uh, they, they firmly believe that knowing how to fly the basic stick and rudder is, is, is crucial. And so here, are, you know, here you, you know, decades later, I'm getting to, to do the same thing. So how old are you? I would, I, would have been, I don't know, 17 or 18. I was, I was, you know, at the kind of the end of my teenage years, mm -hmm. but what was really cool about it was, um, you know, it was obviously in a foreign language and it was, you know, uh, Germany was not the best place to fly. It was often overcast and, um, the, the, you know, you started out training, not in uh, aircraft pulling you up, but, a a big old motor with a, a what's called a winch toe. And it would be like, you know, a quarter of a mile down the hill with a cable and it would pull you up in the air and you would go up like, you know, really high angle of attack. Uh, and then, you know, at the end, you'd, you'd release it and then you'd, you'd fly and then try to catch a thermal and then go up a little bit higher. It was only when you really learned how to do it, you know, better that you, you got to get towed up by an airplane. <laughs> so... It was fascinating stuff. So it was, it also kindled my, you know, interest in aviation. So I have these two loves, you know, the ocean and, uh, and uh, you know, in aviation. Mm -hmm. How did you, so with all this, with all these amazing experiences, how did you integrate them into your passion for medicine and uh, your journey through the Navy? And how did that influence um, how you developed in, in those uh, areas? Yeah, so I've always been interested in biological systems. I loved engineering too. And, and I think if, if I hadn't had so much uh, interest in biology, I would have probably gone in and been an engineer. 
but um, it was the interest in living things, especially undersea things that fascinated me with biology. So I decided I was gonna do something that, that related to biology. And, um, but I still had this passion for, I, 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 and I guess it would be kind of like extreme environments. I like the mountains, I like forests, I even like deserts, you know, and spent time in, you know, in desert situations. And so it was the, the, the fascination with life in extreme places that um, got me into the, you know, the life sciences. And then um, what happened is I went, so I went to school in uh, at Texas A&M, which is a uh, land grant college in Texas. My parents, you know, for my brother and I, they would not pay for college. So we had to go find our own path. And so for me, my path was to do ROTC, you know, because that got, you know, your college, uh, you got support for that. But it was interesting. I mean, in my rebellious high school years, I actually hated the military and I hated what my dad did. You know, he was in Vietnam. And, you know, of course, there was a lot of turmoil in the country with whether the war was just or not. And, you know, I kind of, you know, felt in, in many ways that it might not have been the best thing we could have done, but, you know, we did it. And it was weird how the very thing I, you know, hated in my dad, I ended up doing and following in his footsteps and having a long career. Um, and I think part of it was for me that it was service to others, you know, and service to your country. And it was a way that I was able to do that. And so I was very, you know, kind of patriotic in the sense of doing things for others. Uh, and I would say that's been a, a, a ubiquitous theme throughout my life was the importance of doing things for others. And, and it just it's whatever drives you. But for me, it was the sense of reward that you got by taking helping other people. So I go to college and um, and it had a marine biology program. So I, I did a lot of uh, I did biology, but I kind of minored in marine biology. At the time, they, did, they, had, they didn't have the place they have in Galveston like now. So we would have to go down there from, on weekends to go down and do diving stuff. But my last two years, I did a ton of diving. I mean, a ton. And um, I ended up taking a, a course in hyperbaric medicine at the vet, veterinary college there. So they, they didn't, they didn't, at the time, they didn't have a medical school. They had a veterinary school. And so that was how you learned a lot on you know, biological systems. And then I took a course in hyperbaric medicine by a guy that was a former Air Force um, physiologist. And he had a fascinating career in World War II. He was a paratrooper and he ended up doing all kinds of stuff. And he was in Viet or World War II in Korea and then went and got his PhD. And he had, he had been in medical school in World War II and got drafted. And he, he lost his spot in medical school. And I think he always wanted to go back to medical school. And so he, he was a great mentor. And he said, you know, you got the grades and the talent, you should go to medical school. Well, at the time I was, you know, committed to the Navy, what the Navy was wanting me to do. So I ended up going to, I, I, was, I was in uh, Navy ROTC there. And actually the, in the first class that was formed, uh, for a Navy ROTC there. And so I ended up getting a, a flight billet uh, as a Naval flight officer. I didn't have perfect vision, so I couldn't be a pilot. Uh, so I got the next best thing, which was to be a, 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 a Naval flight officer. And my background, my specialty was in um, low level navigation. And it was uh, basically what they call a bombardier navigator. So I go to flight school, I get my wings. And sure enough, this is the Vietnam War has ended now. And all of a sudden, um, they have no spots for you. Every, you know, there was a huge drawdown in the military after Vietnam. So I finished flight school and it was like, well, uh, we can't use you. And I had actually gotten accepted to medical school in college and they wouldn't let me go because I had a billet to flight school. So I ended up uh, getting getting to go to medical school after I finished flight school, but the caveat was that I had to go to the military medical school that they had just formed, uh, the Uniformed Services University. And it was interesting. The guy that was the dean of the new school there was an infectious disease guy named Jay Sanford, and he was the he would 
he was at the school I'd gotten accepted in, which was uh, University of Texas Southwestern. So he wanted me there because he knew if I could get into Southwestern, I was pretty good. So he ended up, you know, saying, hey, look, we want him here uh, instead of letting me go to Southwestern. So I ended up going there and that was in Bethesda. And that was a great experience, too, because, you know, there was NIH and, you know, Walter Reed and the Navy Hospital. And it was a really great experience. Um, so I ended up going to medical school because my professor in college had, had encouraged me to, to pursue that path. And even though it wasn't right out of the college that I got to go, I got to go, you know, after the Navy decided, hey, even though we've trained you, you know, as a flight officer, you, you know, we don't have any billets for you, so you could go do something else. So it was all serendipity. And I often describe my my career and it has really been what I uh, describe as the acorn in the stream. You know, you're, you know, an acorn that gets kicked off an oak tree and you can end up being eaten by a squirrel or you can end up being grown into a big oak tree. But, you know, it was wherever that stream was taking me was what my, my, my path would be. Um, and basically it's just, you know, I learned to just go with the flow because I had no control over anything in my life. Um, so did you, did you ever find yourself in situations like, well, one, how did you, uh, walk the line between being a medical professional and a military officer? And two, did you ever find yourself, in, find yourself in situations where you were really conflicted and making a decision from a medical perspective and from a military perspective? And are there any particular situations that stand out with regards to that? Well, I mean, that's an excellent question because, you know, the, um, in the in in medicine in the military, you're supposed to be um, a non-combatant, you know, and a, and a, it's a I think a Geneva class four or something. There's a different category. So, um, having been trained as a line officer and a warrior, and then going into medicine, it was there were times where you had to sit there and go, "Wow, okay, remember." you know, what your, your basic, uh, you know, tenant is, you know, um, and taking care of people. And, um, but, you know, along the way, I got to train with other, war, you know, with the warriors, you know, I did a lot of uh, special, you know, special training, you know, with Navy, Navy. So some of the classes I took, like the, I went to Army Airborne School and the uh, Special Forces Freefall Parachute School. And I went, um, you know, those were trained at, for officer, you know, for uh, for um, officers enlisted that are going to go into, you know, combat, and um, the military likes to have their physicians be able to do the kinds of things that the ground troops do, so they can have better understanding and taking care of them. And you know, in a way, um, you 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 can get really amped up by the whole kind of warrior ethos. You know, it's it's a it's kind of a cool thing. Um, and so throughout my training, there were times where I basically kind of crossed the line and I liked doing stuff with the, with the actual, you know, the war fighters themselves. And so I got to shoot a lot of things and, you know, and fly tactical aircraft and, you know, combat kind of aircraft. And I was in Desert Storm as a medical officer with the Marine Corps. And in, in the process of that, I was in the front line. I was with the air wing initially there to do um, the effects of uh, um, both chemical agents that affect the nervous system. And then also um, uh, sustained operations. And that involved uh, using stimulants and sedatives to you know, keep air crew performance going. So, and then at, 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 as things uh, transpired, we ran out of search and rescue corpsmen for the uh, helicopters that would go and recover aircraft and personnel. So um, a bunch of the flight surgeons and us formed a, a, a special unit that would basically send doctors out on these uh, aircraft medevac missions. Um, and it was a precursor to a lot of stuff that the military now does, which is forward deploy you know, resources and have very advanced critical care capabilities for their air transport stuff. The Air Force has been the lead on that. Um, but at the time, you know, Desert Storm, we ended up 
you know, doing a lot of this stuff, you know, basically, um, you know, with our own, you know, wit and, and skills before it had become formalized. Um, but, um, and actually, the, the, I'd say probably over three quarters of our uh, wounded that we picked up were, were enemy prisoners of war. So, and, and in fact, it was funny, I, I remember that during that evolution, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're anti-Iraqi because they've invaded Kuwait and you, you have this kind of thing about just, you know, killing them all. And, and what I found was when I actually saw these prisoners of war, many of whom were Iraqi conscripts, which were basically Saddam Hussein's way of putting his, you know, in poor people out as cannon fodder, I felt I, I realized that that was a very wrong attitude and that I suddenly became overwhelmed with compassion when at, at the time it was like, you know, go out and let's, you know, let's kill them all. And so that was a very important point is to remember that, you know, a lot of times wars are, they're, they're forced by governments, but the, the people themselves are the ones that have to pay the price. And, and just because they're, a foreign country and your enemy doesn't mean the people themselves are. And so that was a really, really wonderful lesson for me is to realize that, you know, there are still people and a lot of times they're, they're more victims than um, the people that the country has attacked. So it would, it, I don't know if that answers the question, but, you know, there are times where you do face that dilemma. Yeah, that was a wonderful answer. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> so can you tell us a little bit about how you chose to get or how you ended up in neurology? I, I think I've heard that you didn't start in neurology. You started your residency in neurosurgery. Is that correct? Yeah. So, you know, in, in my passion for the life sciences and biology, um, I've always been fascinated by the nervous system. And so, um, in fact, in my marine biology early years, I was fascinated by dolphins, you know, which who have, a, you know, essentially a very uh, creative, um, communicative mind and uh, use sounds to communicate. And so I'd been very interested in the nervous system um, in my bi biology pursuits. In fact, when I was in high school, um, in my passion to get out of trouble or quit doing things that got me into trouble, I ended up pursuing, you know, an interest in science. And I, and I did a, a science project on uh, how fish communicate, marine bioacoustics. And I, I won first prize in uh, behavioral science in Virginia, which is pretty amazing considering I just basically built all this equipment and studied two fish that I thought would have good, you know, communication systems. And so um, I've always had, you know, so I have had, I've taken a, an, an interest in biological systems and in biological systems, specifically the nervous system. Now, what I've come to realize is you can't break up or you can't break up the body into a bunch of different organ systems. So uh, I, even though I'm a neuro, I, you know, I was interested in the nervous system. I ended up uh, realizing that there's more to it than just, you know, wires and effect you know sensors and effectors uh, it has to work as a system so in my pursuit like i had studied um you know neuroanatomy a lot in med school in fact our, our neuroanatomy professor was um 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 oh i should i'm blocking on his name it was uh uh um i think malcolm uh carpenter uh, but anyway, he's a f famous neuro, uh, neuroanatomist. And so I, I spent a lot of time studying with him in his lab. And then I started doing rotations in neurology and neurosurgery. And I like neurosurgery because it had a lot of, uh, you know, you could do something, you know, you could intervene and, and do, you know, uh, surgical interventions. And so I pursued that. Uh, I, and I was picked up the, the uh, program director, uh, I think, liked me because I was, an, I was, I had an aviation background and he was a big time aviation guy. Uh, his name was Cal Early. 
And he was a Vietnam era neurosurgeon and a really great guy. And so um, I was in that program, uh, you know, my, I did a surgical internship and then three years of neurosurgery. But in, in addition to my, you know, passion for, you know, doing neurosurgery, I also was a, a, a parachutist with the Marine Corps d- uh, demonstration team. And we did all kinds of stuff. So it, in the very few times I had off, I was also jumping a lot, you know, parachuting. And um, I had, uh, you know, been an Army uh, airborne trained and also Special Forces free fall trained. So I did military jumping, but I also did sport parachuting. And the team was a, a, a military uh, sport parachute team. So I ended up, you know, jumping a lot with them when I could. And my boss was okay with that because he liked aviation and, and parachuting was okay with. But I ended up doing a jump at an uh, Armed Forces Day air show in, at, in Quantico, Virginia, which is where the Marine Corps was. And it was a very windy day and probably we shouldn't have been jumping, but we did. And it was a really cool jump. But the landing, um, when, when I landed, my parachute pulled me off the ground and I landed on both wrists and and I had bilateral navicular fractures. And that was, you know, pretty serious actually, because they didn't heal and, and I was in cast for a long, long time. Right around that time, the program director, uh, Cal Early retired and the new guy came in and he basically didn't like, you know, me and, and he got rid of me and three other guys. So he basically didn't, he cleared out all the people that were in under the previous program director. So, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, he had a good cause to get rid of me because of my, my fractures and I, cause I couldn't operate. And there was, you know, there, I can't remember. It was, it was over half a year where I was still in, 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 you know, risk cast and, and, uh, I look like a crab, you know, because you had these, you know, appendages on your arms. And it was very dis- disheartening to patients to have this guy come up and ra- on rounds of, on a neurosurgery patient with these casts on. So anyway, uh, the bottom line is the new guy, uh, he got rid of me and a couple of three other guys that were in the residency. And uh, so I'm like, well, now what? You know, I mean, here's the my career path just completely, you know, truncated. and um, you know, that's part of my thing in life is to be, you basically just bounce back from everything that, you know, life throws at you. And so it was like, well, I like the nervous system and I got to do surgical neurology and now I get to do medical neurology. So, um, and the guy that was the program director, uh, was a phenomenal guy in undersea stuff, John Hollenbeck, um, and so not only did we have a lot of clinical, really good clinical cases, but we had a huge research effort that was basically the stuff I had started to do in hyperbarics in, in college. So I, I be, you know, just switched right over to neurology. And um, part of the deal was, even though I could have gotten credit for a lot of the neurosurgery training, I, would, I did the whole um, neurology residency, but also had a lot of elective time. And um, and I did a lot of hyperbaric related n- neurologic effects, animal research at the, at, as well. So it was one of those things where, I mean, I get thrown this curveball and have a major career change, but it fit into this kind of master plan that basically go with the flow and, and, and make the most of it. So having had a lot of surgical experience and also medical experience in neurology made it just that much more, you know, useful. Um, so I looked at it like a blessing in disguise. It prolonged my residency. You but were, it, you became one of the neurologists probably that got to spend more time doing real life, like neuroanatomy stuff than any neurologist around probably. Well, yeah. And, and but you got to remember, this was an era, this would have been You know, so I graduated from med school in 80. That was, think about it, that's four decades ago. And honestly, we were still doing pneumoencephalograms and direct carotid stick arteriograms, angiograms. 
And I remember at NIH had one of the first, you know, ME scans, the CAT scan, and literally the pixel sizes were a centimeter. <laughs> so, you know, if you held it far enough away, you could kind of make out the cortex and the ventricles, but, you know, up close, it was just a bunch of boxes, you know, it was really primitive. I mean, this was CAT scan, not MRI. So imaging has totally revolutionized how we practice and especially in neurology, neurosurgery, because it's not so much a guessing game as to where the lesion is. And all we really had in our toolbox was the ability to do neurologic evaluations and localize the lesion. And then based on the localization, come up with a differential. And now with, with the imaging capability, you know, the, especially the magnetic resonance imaging capability, we have the ability to not only tell you where the lesion is, but in the large part by the characteristics of the, you know, weighting of the image itself and the in, uh, various kinds of analysis tools, you can almost tell what, what kind of pathology it is, at least, you know, uh, uh, far more so than we could before. And now, um, you know, a lot of times diagnoses are made by imaging alone without a, bio, without a pathologic biopsy. And that sometimes can lead you astray, but for the most part, the imaging technology, it gives you a lot uh, better handle on things and obviously is a lot less invasive than, you know, sticking a needle in trying to, to biopsy it or, or even worse to just do an open craniotomy and try to excise it and figure out what it is. So, um, so, you know, I was in that era of, you know, the old school and neuro neurosurgery. I, I, I still have a, uh, you know, a brace and bit. It's called a Hudson brace and bit that, that they used to drill burr holes in, in the skull. It's an old carpenter tool. Um, and that's what we were trained on. Um, that was the, you know, that was the kind of thing we had to learn how to do with do craniotomies with a with a thing that's it's like a wood wood drill that the old carpenters used you know a, it was a you know a, a, a brace and bit saw um so you know it was it was very uh, amazing to see the transition in technology advancing in medicine in those in those years um Speaking we, of, we had to learn how to do a good exam because that was crucial, you know, because, you know, the imaging capabilities were far less robust as they are now. That's incredible. Um, and speaking of transitions, we know that you uh, ultimately got interested in space medicine, which I'm sure was also at a very early stage at, at that point. Um, what could you tell our audience a little bit about what space medicine is and um, some of the major advances that have been made in it and how how one can even get into space medicine? So I have to give the caveat that I actually came to space medicine as a um, reluctant participant. Um, so um, I had. Um, I was a naval officer, I was a, a senior Navy captain, and I was running a research department um, in uh, Pensacola. And I had a big budget and uh, was doing really critical stuff. My wife, who was also a naval officer, um, and also, you know, we had met in Navy dive school and she was a submarine medical officer. So as a woman in the, uh, you know, late eighties and early nineties, uh, to be on a submarine was virtually unheard of. And she was in a very austere location in Scotland uh, where they, you know, uh, with a ballistic missile submarine squadron and also covered Navy SEALs. So uh, she decided that she wanted to go to, to be an astronaut. And, and actually part of it was my, uh, I took her to a training exercise, very similar to the one I just completed with the, uh, in preparation for this commercial um, space uh, astronaut program going to the space station where they do an exercise and they, they look at uh, you know, how you handle uh, emergencies. And so she's there with me. I'm, in, I'm, a, I'm one of the uh, um, uh, DOD medical support flight surgeons for that mission. And they, they had a, 
they needed some more casualties. And so she was there and she volunteered. And that's and after that, that training evolution, she goes, hey, I want to do this. You know, I want to go to be an astronaut. She had no uh, idea that that was even something she could do until I kind of introduced her to it. So now she gets picked up in uh, 1996 to go to NASA. And I'm the head of this big um, research department. And the Navy wasn't going to let me go. And I, I didn't want to go because I had a really great job and a really important job. So I ended up going into space medicine as a total, you know, fluke. Um, in other words, she got NASA to, to have me transferred. And um, it was kind of funny because I ended up going to NASA at, at Johnson Space Center. And I get there because, you know, the, the, the military has a rule that says that if you have two, uh, they have two spouses on active duty that you have to try to co-locate them together. So there's a mandate to do that. But the Navy was like, well, you're too valuable here. We don't wanna move you. And so we're not gonna do it. So there was kind of a little bit of a tussle. And then basically NASA had to buy me, buy my contract as it were to get me there. Um, so I get there and I'm kind of like, you know, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't like I was actively seeking it. I ended up going there by essentially like everything in my life is purely serendipity. I end up going there and at, at first I get there and they're like, well, who are you? And I'm like, well, you know, the head of NASA at Johnson Space Center, George Abbey was the one that made pulled this off. And he was a very power. He's a very powerful guy. And he basically had NASA paid to move me to, to Johnson Space Center. But the people in the trenches are like, you know, initially very uh, reluctant to have me there. And they said, well, you can't take care of astronauts because your wife's an astronaut. And so that I, they gave me a, a, a job that nobody else wanted, which was to be the head of the flight surgeon for aircraft operations. And NASA has a huge air fleet of different aircraft, you know, including the T-38 trainers and uh, the, the Gulfstream uh, aircraft they use for shuttle training, all this stuff. I ended up doing that. And I, and I was like, it was like being a junior officer again. And I looked at it and I go, well, you know, this sucks. You know, you're a senior Navy captain running this department, uh, doing all this stuff. And you're having to go back to being a, you know, like a entry level flight surgeon. Well, it turns out I love flying. So, and they love me because I took care of them. So after about uh, three or four months of the being in ostracized and put off on the, you know, in, in the aircraft ops division, the NASA astronaut or the NASA uh, flight surgeon started realizing I had a skill set that might be useful to them. So then they said, well, now you can be, you know, one of us. And so I went through the training there. So I was a space, I'm a space medicine guy, but it had nothing to do with, you know, anything other than pure uh, serendipity and luck. And as a result of that, I actually feel like I'm also blessed because at the time I was, at, when I was at, at uh, NASA or when I was in the Navy, by this time I would have had um, um, over 20 years as a, as, in the, as a Naval officer. And a, a vast majority of that was in aviation related stuff. Because one of my big the job, one of the jobs I got after my neurology residency was to be the head of Naval Aerospace Medical Research or Naval Aerospace Medical Institute Neurology Department. So I ended up going there and I, I rekindle all my aviation interests. And I figured I knew everything by the time um, Laurel went to NASA. She goes there and I get the, and I get to NASA and I, what I realized is I don't know squat about space. Aviation is, is it's, it's combined as aerospace medicine. So there's aero, there's aviation and space, but I knew everything about aviation medicine or at least a, a majority of it, but I didn't know squat about space medicine. So I basically, when I got the opportunity, I basically just knuckled down and said, I got to start at ground zero and start from the ground floor. And what I realized in the 20 years I've been doing space medicine or 20 plus years is that it's a very unique and, and different specialty. 
And part of it is that who gets to experience um, taking care of people who have all these maladies related to microgravity or confined space stuff or uh, radiation. There's a lot about space that is, you know, very unusual. And so, I, I mean, I'm very fortunate to have had a very strong background in the aviation side of things, but then also just by pure luck got to go work at NASA. Um, so what is space medicine? It's a, it's a specialty that is very unique in the sense that it is made up of multiple other diverse specialties. Um, and so it's not, there's no set career path in, into getting there. It was actually coined in the 40, late 40, uh, 40s as a term. This was you know, well over 10 years before we even flew people in space that they said, there's things about space that we need to have a better understanding on. And the Air Force was the lead agency on that and very uh, forward thinking and how to deal with the various things that happen in space uh, without actually having sent people up there. Um, so it's a multidisciplinary specialty and it's not just medicine actually. It's, it's also made up of biomedical engineers, you know, so engineers that have life sciences interfaces, it's made up of um, uh, psychologists um, and cognitive uh, scientists. It's made up of toxicologists. It's made up of uh, physiologists. So when we say space medicine, um, it's not just traditional medicine, as it were. It's a multidisciplinary specialty in medicine, but also all of the, the uh, what we would refer to as allied health professionals. Um, there is a board certification uh, for aerospace medicine under the American Board of Preventive Medicine. Um, and I got board certified in that, not because I went to a residency, but because I had a, they the Navy wouldn't let me go because it would take too long. So I ended up just sitting for the boards and qualifying for, for those. So I had both, both neurology and aerospace medicine boards. But I, you know, it's kind of funny. I'm probably the only person that became a space medicine guy who didn't set his, you know, that was not in my, you know, uh, list of career paths at the time. It just happened serendipitously. So now do you teach residents space medicine or aerospace medicine? Yeah, so I do. I, so Baylor College of Medicine, where I have, a, I, I was uh, there on faculty for a number of years, and then just a few years ago, went to adjunct status. Um, they have a space medicine track. So they have a, um, it's the, probably one of the few medical schools that actually has a space medicine track. And, and the, there are a whole bunch of lectures that are available. I can send you the link to those. You know, so the students in their first couple of years will just do didactic stuff, and then they can do um, uh, a uh, essentially a uh, research elective. Um, and research is very hard to do uh, because of the constraints of doing institutional review boards and subject selection and stuff. And literally, these uh, research projects can take as long as a medical student education is. So what I usually recommend they do is, um, and, the, and I have, I, uh, I'll have one, a, a couple of year of students that will work under me. Well, we'll take a, a specific topic and we'll delve down into it. And then we will, um, you know, their, their um, research is basically to do a, a, a topic, an extensive literature review on it. There have been a few that have done actual student projects, but it's very hard to. And there are some times where we have a, a research that has collected data and that data hasn't been mined yet. And so there's sometimes an opportunity to do that. But yeah, so, so, so the majority of what I do at Baylor College of Medicine is, is, is directed at medical students. Um, the, there's a uh, University of Texas medical branch has a residency in aerospace medicine, and they focus on the um, uh, on resident training. And the residents that they train are mostly go, go to NASA. And I and I'm heavily involved in those folks as well. Um, 
particularly in the summer, they have a course that anybody can sign up for. It's called Principles of Aviation and Space Medicine, and it's about six weeks long. When pre-COVID, it was really nice because it was on site and you could do tours at JSC and you could see all of the various kinds of things, but now it's gone to virtual. Um, and I think I teach um, five or six lectures on that, uh, which I have some of those available on YouTube, not from the course, because they keep it all secret, but I have the, uh, I do the similar talks elsewhere. Um, is it, um, is it like a fellowship or is it something you go into day one out of medical school? So that's a great question. Um, so, aero, so aerospace medicine is the only residency that is sanctioned for aerospace medicine is the American Board of Preventive Medicine. Um, so the American Board of Preventive Medicine has general preventive medicine, occupational medicine, and aerospace medicine. There are quite a number of folks who, for various reasons, decide they don't want to necessarily pursue a residency program. And there are quite, there, there are very few of them. Uh, the military has their, they train aerospace residents in their residency program. So there's a Navy and Army and Air Force program. And then um, there was now only one civilian residency program, that, which is the University of Texas Medical Branch. There had been a, pre a previous one that, uh, for many years at Wright State University, but that shut down a number of years ago. In other countries, they do it more like a, a diplomat slash fellowship program. And so there are multiple paths to do it. Um, and there's also kind of a quasi fellowship. Well, it is a fellowship in aerospace medicine, but it's not like a, a board certification. And that's at Mayo Clinic Scottsdale, who has a very strong aerospace focus. So I would say that, um, you know, there are multiple ways to do this. Um, and it, you know, it's up to you what works best for your career path as to how to pursue that. In general, um, and I, I really like the UTMB program because you have to have a clinical specialty before you can even apply to that residency. And that's really a, an important aspect of it so that you're good at something in medicine. And by medicine, I mean, I've seen folks that have had pathology degrees or, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's just, and now there are even surgical, uh, um, there's a lot of, uh, there's even a space surgical association. So there's a bunch of surgeons that are trying to anticipate for future large colonies and stuff, how we would do surgery. So it's, it actually is encompasses pretty much every uh, discipline now. Um, but I would say for the most part, the folks that go through the residency at UTMB are primarily um, emergency medicine because that's in the, when things, you know, when this stuff hits the fan, that's what you need in a contingency space scenario. Um, but when I was there, uh, there were people that had internal medicine or family practice. I was a neurologist. I was the only board certified neurologist that, that's ever worked at NASA. Um, and psychiatry is, is a big specialty because believe it or not, there's a lot of behavioral health issues that are related to space travel. It's not surprising. Mm -hmm. um, and then also ENT uh, and ophthalmology, which is very strong in both aviation, but also in space. So pretty much any uh, discipline that you are interested in, we, I don't know that there are people in pediatrics uh, yet because that, you know, quite honestly, is a real challenge. Um, How about endocrine and bone issues? Yeah, you know, there, there's an orthopedic uh, surgeon that's, that was at NASA, Linda Shackelford, and she's done a lot of work in there, that area. Uh, orthopedics is a very, you know, obviously we lose bone mass in space at about 10 to 12 times faster than we do as we age normally. So space is an analog for aging in an accelerated fashion. And there's a huge amount of work that's being done in, the, in that arena. Um, 
And obviously endocrine and immunologic function is also affected. But for, for the flight surgeons at NASA that are the ones that, you know, in the clinical care environment, for the most part, they're, you know, uh, emergency medicine, internal medicine, or uh, family practice. And, uh, but there are, there is a sprinkling, like myself as a neurologist or an orthopedist, there's a sprinkling of other disciplines as well. Um, and I, um, there's a book called um, Principles of Clinical Medicine for Space Flight. And um, this book, it's in its second edition. Um, I have this electronically and I have it in my little reference file for, for my med students. I have a bunch of these books electronically. Um, and this is a pretty expensive book. There's also the Handbook of Bioastronautics and a whole bunch of other ones. So if you're interested in, the, in some of the things, this is a really good book. Uh, and there are some other ones out there, but this is uh, the the uh, the the editors. There's two astronauts, astronaut physicians who are editors in that book, and um, so it's it. This is like this is principles of clinical medicine for spaceflight. So it's kind of like the practical, you know, guide of, to things, and that's that's the kind of what I consider the you know the the gold standard. Nice. So to switch conversation to a little bit different topic, um, you mentioned your wife became an astronaut. Can you tell us her name real quick? Yeah, her name is Laurel Clark. And Laurel Clark. Uh, Laurel Salton Clark. She was, her, she was a Scottish uh, ancestry. So it was, uh, she loved Scotland and that's why she was really excited about going to get transferred there, even though it was a very austere duty assignment. And uh, it's funny because there, uh, we were both in the same dive school class and um, there were a lot of guys that were like just petrified to get sent there. And she loved it. And she not only did she cover a submarine squadron as the submarine squadron officer, and she had to qualify for her, Na her Navy Dolphins. You know, it's a dolphin is the little insignia they wear on their you know, their, their chest uh, that's the symbolizes that they're qualified in submarines. Uh, but she also covered a, 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 a SEAL unit in uh, Western Scotland. So she was their, their diving medical officer too. So she, she, she was pushing the envelope of women in, you know, uh, challenging roles in the military. And now women are routinely assigned to submarines. But back then it was a it was actually forbidden. It was it was funny how she got in, even though the rules said you couldn't have women on submarines. So, um, okay. but anyway, we met in dive school, and uh, she she did uh, submarine diving and undersea medicine, and also she was a flight surgeon. So, she uh, when she decided to go to NASA, she had a strong um, you know package. So, it was pretty cool that she got picked up for that and. You know, that's how I ended up in at NASA as well. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us about the um, about the the, I guess, trip to space, the mission that she got selected for? Yeah, so she was in the astronaut class in 96 and um, it was a pretty large class because that was the first group that was going to be allowed to, you know, start doing uh, they were going to be spooled up specifically for space station missions. So a lot of her training, um, she ended up going to Russia and getting all the qualifications for a space station mission, which was the, you know, the kind of everybody wanted to, to do that. They had a mission that um, was more of a science mission. And by science, I mean, it was life sciences and physical sciences and earth sciences. So it had all these different, but it was, it was kind of like this, um, you know, bastard stepchild. That, so it didn't fit with anything that was space station related, which was either assembly or some other aspect to support space station. So that mission was picked in late, um, the late nineties, they started the assign crew to that. And because it had a lot of life sciences uh, experiments on it 
uh, they actually decided they were going to put not just one physician, but two. So there were two physicians assigned to that. And um, both of them are, were Navy uh, flight surgeons, my wife and then and Dave Brown was the other one. And so um, their job was to do all of the science, life sciences part, you know, which could include um, blood draws and, you know, things that would require a medical background or at least something that where you, you know, you, you weren't squeamish around doing biological samples and stuff like that. And um, it was a really uh, uh, arduous mission in the sense that there were so many science projects that were put on it that they actually had to split the crew into two teams. So they were up always somebody up working and doing something for 24 hours a day. And that does, that's not a very common thing. Most of the shuttle assembly missions were, you know, you, you would just have one shift and then everybody was up and everybody was sleeping at the same time to do that. Um, but because the mission did not have a driver, like say for example, a space station assembly mission, it's got to go at a certain time because you have to have this module before the next module. And there's a lot of coordination and, and uh, organization that goes into the space station missions. Those always took priority. So uh, Columbia was the Columbia mission, uh, the SCS 107 mission was always getting bumped for something. In fact, it uh, the Columbia was was it didn't have an airlock that would go to and, and dock to space station and it was planned to get that airlock after the columbia uh, mission the sts-107 mission and so it was also used to support the other main non-iss type shuttle mission which was the hubble repair missions so and that did have a higher priority because the, usually what happens is something's going wrong on the hubble space telescope and so they have to go up there and they change batteries and put in different um, replacement units that are broken and not working. So Columbia was the STS-107 mission was literally the last priority in all the shuttle flights. And so it kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. In, long, in retrospect, that was a, a blessing because what happens is, and I was a shuttle, uh, I was a shuttle uh, flight surgeon a shuttle mission gets a sign and around six to eight months before the mission is supposed to take place, the crew gets assigned, they start doing their training flows and they work their way up to it. Columbia was, a, the, the STS-107 mission was assigned and they kept getting bumped. But what that allowed is the crew <coughs> to have extensive team building experience. And, um, and they also started doing things like sending them to the um, Knowles National Outdoor Leadership School for team building. That was de uh, designed to be something that would help unify a crew, especially a space station crew. And, and they were the first um, astronauts to go to, to that training evolution. And as a result of that experience and how, how really beneficial it was, it was now used for all NASA astronauts when they first get to NASA, they go through uh, National Outdoor Leadership School. And then when they get assigned to a mission, they go through it again to, to bond the team itself. Um, so that was something that they got to do and they, they were traveling all over the place because the international, there was not just US payloads, there was a number of uh, countries like, you know, involved in the European Space Agency they also had the first Israeli astronaut who was assigned to that mission. And that was a earth observation mission called the Mediterranean um, European uh, Mediterranean uh, dust experiment. Um, so uh, there was a, the Israeli astronaut that was assigned to that mission. So it was a very eclectic group. There was a, uh, a woman that was uh, uh, Casey, uh, um, Chawa was the Indian or Indian heritage. So there were a number of folks that were kind of represented a hodgepodge of every different kind of group you could imagine. It was really kind of neat, but because they had about three years of, instead of a six month training flow and then flying, it was, it was more like three years. And because of that three year training flow, they became a really uh, 
uh, intensely bonded crew, um, which was really kind of uh, neat to see. Um, that's not typical for space state or for shuttle missions. What they realize is that the um, any crew that goes to space station, you know, where you're working together, you know, they have 18 months of training, a six month mission, or even a year long mission. You cannot have people that don't get it and get along together. Mm -hmm. And um, there were I've I've known space station crew that were getting reassigned because one of the crew had a medical issue and the crew member would say, I'm not going to fly with that guy. I mean, I can fly with him on a short shuttle mission, but I'm not going to go for six months because they're just, you know, how there's people that just click with you personality wise or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that ability to bond in a relationship where you're intimately dependent on each other for your own survival and a long mission where things can start to wear on you, you know, like, um, you know, the things that you would imagine in a college roommate scenario, you know, like eating my stuff or uh, not cleaning the toilet or, you know, borrowing my clothes, that kind of stuff. Um, it can cause crazy reactions. And most of that people don't realize, but there has been homicidal uh, attempts there's been suicidal you know attempts on space in space fights i mean all kinds of crazy behavioral stuff um you can't just come back tomorrow you can't just move out yeah you're you're stuck well, imagine, and and you know imagine that you'd be stuck in a winnebago like and and i'm and you know you're in a winnebago for six months with somebody mm -hmm. you know so it's that's a real challenge so uh, it, they, you have to have that sense of uh, bonding. And what it really boils down to is what they call expeditionary behavior, where literally you have to totally shift your mindset to being all about the mission and the team and no longer about yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a, a, a key th a part of the training that the uh, National Outdoor Leadership School does is to focus on expeditionary behavior where you got to take care of yourself and make sure you're up and running but but you cannot be it's all about me you know and um and what you see is that this overwhelming sense of you know taking care of each other um and it fortifies the strength of of the the bond it's almost like what we would have probably had to endure as a species in our kind of hunter-gatherer era where everybody had to be part of the effort even though you know you might not have the physical skills or whatever everybody had to contribute to that uh that effort mm -hmm. uh and it's a um you know it it's something that in this environment is is not just a nicety it's an essential component maybe the essential component so can you... i think in medical School, medical schools now, you know, used to be very focused on training individuals. And now I think there's been a strong recognition that we have to work as a team together. And you think about it, you know, you got uh, doctors and nurses and anesthetists and, um, you know, uh, various technicians that support various things. And so medicine and medicine has finally come around to that also having to work as a, as a team. It was recognized in aviation early on when there were pilots who were like the boss and there was a very strong hierarchical component to it that you know the senior guy was the boss and it was absolutely his way. And there were serious fatal accidents that resulted from that kind of domineering my way or the highway kind of boss. And that is not what we know to be the most effective way we work as a species. Even the smartest guy, the most experienced guy needs to get input because, uh, and there were times where, the, the, you know, the uh, aircraft would crash because the, you know, the senior pilot just refused to acknowledge that there was any other, anything wrong or there was any other way to do something. So um, that was a big thing that I, I, I learned early on in aviation, how working as a team was a crucial part of it. And there's even courses that are trying to teach 
the lessons from aviation into the met, you know, into the medical uh, teamwork process. Yeah, ego can ego can get in the way, and in anything where you have a goal that requires oh, absolutely, a lot of people. Um, so, can you tell us about what happened on February first, two thousand three? And then what happened after that and how you were one of the few people in a position to be able to, you know, really make a difference? Yeah, so the, the, this was the Columbia mission, uh, STS-107, was um, the 113th shuttle flight. And uh, it, kept, it kept, you know, it kept getting bumped. So even though 107 was, they, they, they don't launch in order of the number. And mm -hmm. so there were quite a few missions that were later numbers that flew first. So it, it was a science payload. It launched in uh, the 16th of February or 16th of January and, and was due to land on the um, uh, 1st of February. And so, um, boy, that, I mean, that was just the most um, unbelievable, you know, life-changing, um, life-altering event in my life in my life um and i was in a very unique and perhaps even almost uh unusual weird position i was a nasa by this time i had retired from the navy and i was a nasa civil servant and i was i was a senior guy i was a gs 1510 and um i was the head of medical operations and this mission uh you know um even though I was a NASA uh, uh, shuttle flight surgeon and I wasn't assigned to the mission, I still worked part of the mission uh, to fill up shifts that were, you know, uh, because they were going 24 hours a day, they, they just didn't have enough flight surgeons to do it. So I ended up actually working in that mission at, in mission control as one of the flight surgeons, which is probably not necessarily something they wouldn't ordinarily allow, but it was just it was just kind of out of necessity. They just they just didn't have enough flight surgeons. So Are you kind I kind of on standby during that. Like, there's not much medical stuff they need from you at the moment, right? Like, if everything goes well, or well, I mean, for the space station because it's twenty four seven forever. Mm -hmm. They end up they do have home call and and they're they, they you know it's it's a it's a mer it's a it's a much longer evolution. So they end up putting people on call, but for, for shuttle missions that have the, if the crew are up, there's gonna be a flight surgeons up and in mission control. And that way they're not the, you know, you're rubbing your eyes, tired, getting a phone. You know how it is, if you've ever, you know, I mean, you'll, you'll experience that in your career, but um, there is nothing like being on, on site to be able to handle something when something, you know, the stuff hits the fan. So, um, we would, for a mission that the crew is up 24 seven with two shifts, there will be a flight, a flight surgeon up as well. And that way, if anything happens, they're instantly available. They're not, they're awake, you know, they're sitting on console, they're hearing everything that's going on. It's not the call from to home, you know, where you're trying to figure out what's going on, you know, with limited information and also the sleep inertia that you're having to overcome. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it's it's a special scenario where you have you have people there twenty four seven, um, and it was because the crew the crew was up, and so that there would be a flight surgeon there, and that's when I found out during that uh, those shifts I found out about the foam strike, and um, I had a good friend that was working with me that uh, on the, those shifts who was also filling in. Uh, the shifts and I was like wow this is really weird what do we do you know and I so I kind of knew that there had been a, a foam strike and that there was a big um discussion about the damage that was done and there were those that were saying well we don't think there's any damage you know kind of you know uh basically just hoping for the best and and not wanting to pursue it and look for it, which would have, I think, no question, we could have identified that there had been damage. So anyway, reverse I'm, a little bit. I'm not familiar with the phone strike. Yeah. So 
what happened on launch, like 73 seconds into launch, the external tank, which is a cryogenic liquid oxygen and hydrogen is covered with insulating foam. It's like the foam uh, that you put in your attic, you know, that foam that fills up and hardens. And it's meant to insulate the tank so that the, um, if, you, if you had exposure of the, the tank metal to the cold, you know, of, I mean, these, and these are cryogenic, you know, um, compounds that are a few degrees above, you know, the, the, you know, the zero degrees Kelvin. I mean, they're super cold, you know, hundreds of degrees of minus centigrade. So the foam is there to keep the ice from forming. And unfortunately the foam is sprayed on. And so it has gaps and air bubbles and voids in it. And what happened is on launch as it's going up and it's shaking and it's getting a reduced pressure, uh, one of those little bubbles blew off a chunk of foam that was just a pound and a half or so, but you know, pretty good size. And the shuttle hit it at over 700 miles an hour and punched a hole in the wing. And so there was a discussion because there was footage of the launch where there was evidence something that had come off and hit the wing. And there was a big discussion about it. And bottom line is that the upper management basically forced it to, to not be pursued. Um, the idea was you could use telescopes on earth or even um, you know, the same kind of telescopes that look at uh, countries, you know, like the uh, NRO keyhole satellite series, they could just basically be repositioned to hit and view the shuttle. If they can read a license plate from space, they can see a hole in a wing as big as your head. So, mm -hmm. um, so there was a big discussion about it. So on the 1st of February, the entry was proceeding um, and 90 minutes before you want to come down, you do, you turn the shuttle around, you do a deorbit burn, you slow the uh, velocity, and then you just drop and start falling out of the, in, into the atmosphere. And as you fall into the atmosphere, you turn around and you enter with the pointy end forward. And, um, and then uh, 90 minutes later, you're, you're coming down to land. Once that deorbit burn is accomplished, there is no turning back. It's not like you can go, ooh, look, we don't, we don't want to come down. So once the, once the decision to do the deorbit burn was made, it, that the, the shuttle's coming down. And there had been a lot of discussion about we need to find out what was happening with the foam. And if we see something, we might be able to fix it. You know, there was a lot of arguments going on in, in, in the context of uh, mission control. So, and I was privy to some of that, not the whole discussion, but at least the knowledge that there had been an, un, a, an event that resulted in a foam coming off and potentially damaging the shuttle. So now I'm in Florida with, and I, you know, so I, I take off my hat as a shuttle flight surgeon and put on my hat as a family member and go with the rest of the families to uh, Cape Kennedy, which is where I, you know, I do a lot of work there now, even today. And um, we're at the shuttle landing strip, which is just a few miles from the launch site. And it's a 15,000 foot runway that they land on. And I've been to a, a numerous, countless numbers of shuttle landings. So it's something that I knew very closely um, because of my, you know, experience. And I know that uh, on that day, it was about, it was about 9 a.m. Eastern time. The shuttle is coming in and they have a countdown clock right there on the, on the uh, landing strip where, the, uh, where we were, were waiting. And you see it counting down. And also during that time, they have communication between shuttle and mission control. It's on a big loudspeaker. And I was hearing things that were clearly not what were normal, you know? Um, and so I was already getting a kind of a funny feeling like something's not right here. And basically it was um, talking about a tire alarm that the shuttle had, had uh, generated and that mission control was trying to figure out what was going on. And you go, tire alarm, that's not a good thing because 
the shuttle lands at 200 miles or 200 knots, 200 miles an hour, or it's, it's over 200 miles an hour. And it can't land without landing gear. It can't land and belly in or, you know, ditch in the ocean because the speed is so high, it just cartwheels and breaks up. So I knew that a landing gear problem was a very serious event. And um, actually, if it was, if, if it had only been a landing gear problem, they would have probably done what they call a bailout from the shuttle um, over, you know, somewhere up, up higher. So I was already thinking, well, this is certainly not a normal thing. And I'm not sure they'll even get back to the, the landing strip because if they have a tire issue, they can't land without a tire um, or you know, a, a landing gear problem. And turns out what was happening is that hole that was punched in the left leading edge of the wing, uh, which was about the size of your head, during the re-entry, you're exposed to the uh, plasma gas, which is like a cutting torch. It's 4,000 degrees, and it, and and even in the the shuttle landings, you see the plasma coming around the windows. It's like this, it's hot arc jets, and sure enough, that plasma gets into the wing and starts cutting through wires, and that's why that alarm went off. And then it basically cut through the wing spar, and the wing just broke off. During that time, as they could tell from the uh, flight data recorder that was covered in the investigation, that the vehicle was actually, you know, you know, doing uh, unusual um, motion, clearly out of control. And, and, um, and, and part of our analysis was actually to figure out exactly what that motion was and how long the crew was uh, um, still ac actively able to respond. So. It's a, it was a very weird day for sure. I mean, we're at the landing site. This countdown clock goes to zero. Um, ordinarily, a, a couple of minutes beforehand, the shuttle comes through the upper atmosphere and you hear sonic booms, which are very loud. They sound like a two double barreled shotgun blast. A boom, boom. Big concussive uh, sensation in your chest. It often sets off car alarms, you know, that shock wave. It's like, the car gets, you know, like a somebody moved it. And so you'll hear the sonic boom and then you start hearing all the car alarms go off in the parking lot. None of that happened. So I knew this was, you know, I mean, a serious situation. And kind of my hopeful, wishful thinking was, well, they, they've had to do a bailout. You know, and Laurel had, like me, had done a lot of parachuting. So she was very experienced. So I was like, you know, just default to plan you know, the next, the next option is, you know, they're not landing here, but they're, they're going to come get out somewhere else. We race back to, um, so we're on the shuttle landing facility strip, and we race back to the astronaut crew quarters, which is in the, a couple miles away. And there, are, uh, for all the landings, there are family escorts that are made up of NASA astronauts who are close to that family. And so the family escorts, uh, as all this is transpiring, their cell phones are going off and you can just see that kind of, you know, they're all, all their phones are going off and they're, and they're obviously, you know, like ashen and like something's amiss. So they rush everybody to the uh, suburbans and get us in and drive back to the head astronaut, um, uh, the astronaut uh, crew quarters. And that astronauts spend their, uh, days before the flight in quarantine there and so they have all their stuff there you know their clothes and all the stuff they don't take to space with them and we rushed back there and it was a you know uh, it's a big facility so it's got a, a huge kitchen area and living room and dining room and and uh, you know um, it's meant for not so much entertaining but keeping the crew you know engaged or involved when they're in quarantine and sometimes because a shuttle would get delayed they could be there for weeks so it's kind of like a government hotel with its kitchen staff and you know all the fancy stuff not super fancy but it's nice in that complex is uh the the uh, crew surgeon uh office and i have a key to that 
So I, well, we're all brought back there and waiting to hear what's going on. I go into the crew surgeon office and I turn on the TV and I watch the footage from the Dallas news media showing the shuttle coming in and, you know, and star bursting. And I knew that's not good because that's, you know, they're up really high and they're going really fast. And the starburst is indicating that the thing is breaking apart. And as soon as I walk back out into the area where all the families are waiting, the head of the astronaut office, uh, Bob Cabana, who is also an astronaut, uh, comes out and says, hey, the, we have for mission control um, an in indication that the shuttle has broken up and that it's not likely to be survivable. Now, in Mission Control, they were also watching that footage that was being played live on the early Saturday morning over Dallas as the shuttle was breaking apart. So that was, you know, it, it's not absolute confirmation, but, you know, what happened is they see that starburst and they see that they're no longer getting data from the shuttle, you know, downlink data, and that they have no radar identification of it you know like aircraft and spacecraft have a transponder that will you know be pinged and it will say hey i'm here i'm here i'm here what they did see on if you look at the weather radar that day you can see in the weather radar what meteorologic conditions and you can see the debris coming down it's really you know, so in, it's no longer a, an object, it's just a massive, like, aluminum cloud coming through, and you can see it moving. It's really amazing. This was all footage that we analyzed, you know, in the aftermath of the Columbia mishap. Um, there's a, uh, you know, the kids are crying, everybody's really, you know, I mean, it's probably the most blood curdling screams I've ever heard of, from people. You know, they're sobbing, they're hugging each other. And very quickly, the families uh, are trying to figure out what's going on. You know, I mean, other than, you know, the, the crew isn't coming home and they're probably not alive. Um, and it was weird because the kids after maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and I, Ian was eight years old and there were a lot of kids in that general age group, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, elementary or middle school kids maybe a few high school kids, they go off and they're pulled off uh, separately into a, a, the, the room that has a bunch of kid games in it. And they just, after a few minutes of crying, they're just playing. And I remember there was an astronaut there, um, Barbara Morgan, who was Krista McAuliffe's backup on Challenger in 1986. So the, and it was, Weird, the two times that she'd been to the Cape uh, for a launch, you know, was when Krista McAuliffe, her friend and colleague, and she was the backup astronaut for dies. And now she's here again, and the same thing is happening. And I remember saying to her, I said, God, this must make you feel like you're jinxed because every time you're here, there's something bad happened. And she goes, No, I think I was meant to be here to help you all. And, uh, and, and I said, how are we going to deal with this? And she goes, you know, you're, gonna, you're not going to believe this, but the children will help us get through this, you know, because that it's kind of like it's what it's all about. You know, it's how the next generation has to deal with stuff. And you think about, you know, our ancestors, you know, and everybody in every family has a story, a history of how they, you know, we're all immigrants, you know, of sorts, you know, uh, somewhere. And how we've endured various kinds of hardships throughout the ages. And um, it's, we've gotten some perhaps soft as we've become super, you know, controlled and westernized and everything else, but bad things happen to people. And it's a part of our lives that we just have to deal with it. And I don't mean that in a trite way. It's like, you have to find goodness and evil. You have to find tragedy and turn it into triumph. And, and, and that would just became my focus was somehow we've got to get over this and make it right. Um, and, you know, for in a weird way of much of the thing that's, that's transpired, 
in the aftermath of the shuttle disaster has been that in pursuit of that. And I was been truly blessed to be able to say, hey, you know, as bad as it was, we've made it better and safer. And, the, you know, others are not going to stop flying in space or doing things like that. We're going to just find a safer way to do it. And it wasn't my plan, but it's certainly become my, that's my mission. Wow. So, and you mentioned just now how you turned tragedy into triumph. How, how did, what were the steps that you took after that situation to, to move forward? And, and, and how was, how did that transform you um, over time in, uh, in a positive way? Well, that's a great question. Uh, and I, you know, I think you don't know it till it happens to you and you just figure it out. So I think part of it is, um, you know, li you, you live in the moment and just try to make, you know, the best of it. So, you know, obviously there's massive amounts of uh, grief going on. I mean, and, and it's almost like undescribable amounts of grief, you know, so we get back and, um, you know, it's interesting how uh, NASA you know, was, they were ready, but they weren't ready. You know, they have a plan, they had, you know, they have a contingency plan for this very kind of thing, but they just don't ever think that it's going to happen. And for the most part, they did a pretty good job and just do it. You know, it's kind of, there's a quote I like from Arthur Ashe. It's start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And that really is the mantra of how you deal with anything is, you know, be, be here now and and deal with everything that you can deal with and the stuff that you can't deal with you just put up put up put past you you know if there's things you like you know i can't bring her back i can't uh undo this situation so all i can do is make it better for those that are are still alive and you know in my career i've had three near-death experiences and I've taken care of a lot of people who perished in the pursuit of serving their country or pursuing a, you know, um, their, their uh, life stream or whatever. And even in medicine, you see a lot of death and you, each one of those is an opportunity for you to um, learn how to deal with this in a productive way. And it's, it sounds trite, but it's, it really is that was what is what sustained me is that you just have to find something that you're able to turn uh, tragedy into triumph and um, and don't you know don't give up and just do what you can um, and the weird thing is that I ended up pursuing all these other things in you know safety for space operations not because of my intent down you know early on i had this is one more thing in my acorn and the stream path you know is that it just this is what the the cards have been dealt and you have to play the cards and you just make the best out of a situation that you possibly can um and so that lesson is uh, is for everybody that faces those kinds of challenges whether it's a loss of a loved one or a, a, a very terrible unfortunate situation you know like a surgical complication that goes wrong or you know dealing with a, a grieving uh, parent that has had a, a child who suffered from some kind of terrible you know uh, childhood cancer all those kinds of things um, you you've got to find the spiritual uh, resolve to uh, press on and make it better for those that follow and and take care of the living because dying, once you're dead, it's, 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 it's over, but it's the living that have the suffering to carry on. And that's the people that we can do the most for. Um, so um, that, ha that has happened. And I have no idea how I ended up getting in this position, but um, it certainly changed me as a person. I, I like to think that Laurel's spirit has permeated me in a positive way because i always kind of like this 
you know, guy that just, you know, maybe was a little bit more self-centered and not as focused on other people as I could have been or should have been. And in many ways, Laurel gave me a gift in her passing, which has been to do the best you can with uh, what you have and to change who you are. It's the only thing we really effectively can change is ourselves. And so for me, that change happened and it's continually evolving in that same realm. Um, That's interesting. So not only did, did you change from within yourself, but you also were driven to then go learn and you know, find out exactly what happened and you've made space travel a little bit safer for the ones that are coming next. Can you kind of describe um, a little bit of the things and stuff that you did after that? And from my understanding, you've been contacted by different jumpers and you've helped develop safer uh, technology for, for people doing stratospheric jumps. Is that correct? Well, that was, so the, 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 the stratospheric jumps came, um, you know, as an, as a natural extension of crew escape systems that would be used by spacecraft. So the, the unusual situation was that I was a NASA civil servant in the organization that was having to deal with this in, you know, the, the aftermath of the, the, uh, STS 107 mishap. And in that process, I played a role um, that would be very unusual, which would be to basically be involved in the investigation of your spouse's death, you know, in a, you know, a federal government operation, which obviously, you know, would, you would say, well, you know, you're going to come after NASA with a vengeance or uh, you're going to have a motive of, you know, whatever. And there was, you know, even the, the, so there are NASA psychiatrists, many of whom were colleagues I work with at NASA who had to weigh in like when this started to happen, uh, the investigation part, um, I, was only, I was involved in the second big investigation. The first one was the Columbia Accident Investigation Board and that was convened literally hours after the event. And there were, um, their focus was to find out what, was, what brought the shuttle down. There, as it happened to, to pass, there were several people on there that I was very um, close to, and you know, in other words, knew knew very closely. And so, throughout that, they were actively involving me in some of the discussions that were ongoing, and you know, just to get my input. Um, and uh, amazingly, um, that um, gave me something to focus on that I could make, that I could do, you know? So it's, it's not at all unusual to be overwhelmed by grief such that it becomes the, the, your, your, your persona. And um, I've had, you know, different people who've lost loved ones in various kinds of things. And sometimes they just become trapped in that perpetual grief. And for me, that this became something that I could focus on that would be able to take something tragic and work on it and in a way that would be, I mean, you can't argue with if you can figure out a way to make it better or, you know, safer, that's, that's, that's a, a noble thing. And so it, it's, it's something I could put my emphasis on. And, um, and, and in the process, allow me to go through that grieving, pro, you know, grieving, you know, transition. And they talk about, you know, the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, you know, stages of terminal illness, but it, it's, it's virtually anything that's a, a tragedy. It's, you go through these, not necessarily in any order and not necessarily every one of them, but it's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And, and invariably I saw how it, you know, my son went through various stages like that. And, and, and I also went through various stages like that. And what I realized is that you've got to get to the acceptance stage 
with as little uh, digression through these other ones, because that's the one that is going to allow you to um, effectively um, move on. And like I said, you know, dying is the easy part. It's the living that's the hard part. And so this was my journey through the life and the aftermath of a tragedy. And um, again, it was not orchestrated. It wasn't like I said, well, by golly, I'm going to make it better or safer or do this or that. It was just this opportunity came up. And, you know, the, the first opportunity was the Columbia Survival Investigation Team that I was on. and because I had been a, uh, so the shuttle crew, after the Colum uh, the Challenger mishap in 86, all wore escape suits and parachutes. So they had, a, they had a survival suit and a bailout parachute, and they were trained in that. So if there was ever an opportunity that they could have done that, this would have been it. And, and why the, didn't that happen? Well, so here I am, I'm a NASA, uh, I'm a senior civil servant. I have a background in, uh, uh, as a high altitude parachutist. And also I had been heavily involved in the escape suit um, work throughout the shuttle career because I was interested in it. For example, I was often the, the flight surgeon that would go to the various uh, shuttle sites and do the training for the crews that would do that rescue recovery activity. Um, so I knew that I knew that process both as when I was in the Navy doing that and then also at NASA. And so it became evident to folks that I had a skill set that was really unique in that. And so they asked me to to participate. And there was a discussion about whether it was you know legal because I was a family member or whether it was a you know good for you know, was it going to be detrimental to me? And the, the psychiatrist had said, no, this would be, the, he, he'll be, you know, fine with it. Part, part of the reason is, is in the military, because we'd seen so many, you know, adverse things happen, you learn to compartmentalize. And you can't take, you can't, you just can't be paralyzed by grief or tragedy or fear or any of those other things. You just, you just say, okay, it's this is this is done, and and we're gonna we're gonna move forward in this way. Um, and I do believe that it was an effective way for me to deal with the tragedy by having a focus that would be a benefit for those who you know uh, that follow. But it wasn't like I set my I set out on that path. It was it was again being put in that position where it was my, um, you know, a certain serendipitous circumstance that allowed me to do that and make the best out of a, a tragic situation. Going through, you know, your loved one's autopsy material, uh, going through all of the, and some of that is, it's, it's, it's finally been published. There were two reports that we put out. Um, both were several hundred pages and, um, the Columbia report came out, the Columbia Accident Board report came out in 2003, the end of 2003, the year it happened. And then in 2008, we finished our crew survival investigation report. And uh, that showed how the crew died, you know, how the, how the crew survival systems that we had in place failed uh, or could be improved. And then in 2014, we were able to publish the aeromedical lessons learned this was how the crew died specific you know uh, and it was very much geared towards you know the medical you know uh, forensic stuff and there was a lot of effort that early on that never would have happened if we were had pushed to try to do that early on there would have been a lot of pushback but over time it became evident to everybody that this work has been done and that this information would be vital to, you know, help not just NASA and other governments that fly space, uh, uh, human space flight, but also the commercial sector, which was starting to rapidly spool up. So it became all the, the it became all the right thing to do for the right reasons. 
and as such, it it's made a huge a, a huge amount of um, impact. So, in two thousand and nine, at right after I, the Columbia uh, the Columbia Crew Survival Investigation Report came out, there was a, a group that was going to do this stratospheric freefall project that was uh, funded by Red Bull, and and so um, one of the guys that had found out or was asked to, to be on it was in the was in both the the challenger investigation and the columbia investigation his name is jim bajan and he's a great guy and he was asked about how uh an effort could be su to support this high altitude free fall which is essentially what the astronauts could do in the event of what happened in columbia where the vehicle broke apart they're in pressure suits, they have a parachute system, they have oxygen bottles, and they can survive. So it became an opportunity to take a, 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 a private project or a private funded effort and make it valuable to both the space industry and also other, you know, whoever else was interested in high altitude survival. And that was the, you know, the Red Bull Stratus mission that I was involved with. So Jim Bajan was the one that got me on, on board and I was their uh, chief medical officer. And in large part, it was because I had all this other background that could help this mission come about. Now, there had been attempts in the 60s to do the same kind of thing, a, a, a stratospheric bailouts. And um, one, there was one guy that was a, a, cit a private citizen who tried it. There was a, the U.S. Air Force effort, and there was the Russian effort. So there were four people that had attempted to do this in the 60s, and two had died. So that just shows you how dangerous it was at the time Red Bull Stratus was kicking off. You know, um, you go to Everest, I think from Camp Four to Everest Summit is one in 12, you know, you know, so, you know, maybe, uh, you know, around a, a, a mortality rate of 10%. But at the time that we were doing this, it was 50% of the people that had tried this, 50% had died. So, um, you know, no matter how you look at it, this was a really risky endeavor. And um, we wanted to make sure that that was going to be done for the right reasons. Now, obviously, Red Bull was interested in doing it for a um, a record, but it, their real drive was a flight test program. So we were going to have a, you know, aerospace groups. Most of them had a background in military or extreme and austere scenarios, and and it was a it was a wonderful opportunity um, because um, I got to uh, what what happened is it was like we don't know we don't we don't know how to do, to deal with this high. Uh, hazard risk environment so i basically could put together a team that um would figure it out and amazingly the way i did it was um you know why we don't nobody's an expert in this now i i know a little bit about stuff but i'm not an expert so we had to go into it with the assumption that we're going to learn a lot along the way but there is no grand scheme of solutions to it. It's all got to be thought out in a, a methodical, systematic approach. And um, because I was at uh, Baylor College of Medicine, <laughs> and I was also teaching at the residency program at Galveston and UTMB, I basically, um, I had people that came up to me and said, hey, you know, uh, I'd like to do a project in this area. And they didn't even know about Red Bull Stratus going on. One was an Air Force guy. And he said, I'd like to review the, you know, free fall program the Air Force did. And I said, well, I got something better. You can actually work with the guy that did it, Joe Kittinger, who was our senior advisor. And then all along the way, um, for all of the major threats that we faced, I would appoint a resident or a med student as lead on that. Can you imagine that kind of responsibility? That was so freaking cool. That's what we uh, all wish we could get as a med student, some sort of 
fun. Well, the, the thing is, though, the, the downside is that it, it's so cool that everything else sucks in life. And let's face it, there's a lot of suckiness in, you know, uh, doing stuff. Uh, and, and healthcare is no, no different. But every one of those folks um, was appointed as the, as the, as the lead. And they're going to do the literature review. They're going to do the uh, analysis and how we deal with this. And part of the reason is, is there are no experts out there. The other thing is that med students and residents are not, um, they're not tainted by past experience, you know, so they can come at it with a fresh look. And, uh, and um, it was the uh, first time that Red Bull ever actually wanted to have an educational component to this jump program. And so what happened is we were able to build this team up. Uh, everybody was a volunteer and we would go at this, you know, in a systematic way to look at how to, how to deal with that. And it was, it was an unbelievable uh, endeavor. And every one of the uh, team members, and I'm trying to remember how many it was, probably I, I wanna say six or seven uh, med, med students and residents that were involved in them. And every one of them would be first author on the primary threat uh, area of their uh, responsibility. And, uh, and then virtually all of them now work in, at NASA or in the space program. So, and then the cool thing is that Red Bull, the Red Bull project, which generated a huge amount of insight into this, um, basically, there was another team that was contemplating doing it at, at the, when Red Bull finished. And they came to us and they said, we're, we're facing this, a similar you know, operation with a different spacesuit. And it was privately funded by a Google executive, Alan Eustace. And we brought our whole medical team over on that project. And in two years and 10 days later, they beat Felix's altitude record. So Felix got to 128,000 and he broke the speed of sound at Mach 1.25. You know, it's like 740 miles an hour. And Alan Eustace got 136,000 feet. He was using a whole different system, but it, it actually was much safer in many ways. Uh, and our team was able to be involved in both of those projects. It was an unbelievably cool effort. Uh, so, you know, that ends and now we're you know still doing some other you know follow-on stuff but the thing about it is that the lessons learned from the columbia uh investigation and crew survival were directly applicable to the red bull project and then directly applicable to alan eustace's uh stratic space dive project and each one of those has enhanced the ability to to get out or at least a better understanding of how you survive in these extreme environments. And even to this day, we're still doing some, some projects in, uh, we've decided, for example, one of the big things that came out of it was the damage to the, uh, the Columbia crew and the exposure to the vacuum of space was able to be evaluated by autopsy material. And based on that analysis, it was decided that there was a potential, it was, it looked similar to a acute respiratory distress adult lung that you might see and how that was treated. We decided we would use a, an advanced uh, uh, percussive ventilator system that would make uh, it, the damage of the lungs uh, potentially, we could still oxygenate and ventilate them until their lung tissue healed. And so we've uh, fielded that in both the Red, the Red Bulls and Stratus space dive projects uh, with that percussive ventilator. And that was one of the you know, key, key things that came out of that was, you know, if somebody does get exposed to vacuum, how do you, how do you, you know, uh, uh, keep them alive? Because the most prominent damage that occurs almost immediately is the, is the lung tissue damage. So, we're now doing, uh, uh, you know, preliminary work on an, in an animal on an animal study, and then be able to actually evaluate it. We fielded this thing without actually testing it. It was a, you know, it was a 
it was a, uh, a, a FDA approved uh, medical device so we could use it in an off-label capacity, but we want to go and follow up with some follow-on tests and actually evaluate its efficacy. Um, uh, unlike what we did, which was basically it's, you know, the worst, the, the thing is if we do nothing, you die. So at least we've got a fighting chance with this. So that was one of the things that came out of that. And by the way, I have all those articles electronically available. And then there's several videos of the, that tell that story. Um, but it's one of those things that is just, you know, applied problem solving for, you know, uh, you know, in our careers in medicine, uh, uh, that is one of the most important skills that we could ever, uh, you know, possibly learn is just how to solve problems. So Dr. that's my story. Dr. Clark, thank you so much. Um, you, you know, your journey and uh, your story is, is so inspiring and we gain so much wisdom from this um, from this episode and and i just want to thank you for joining us on the show those are all the questions for me dan do you have any more do you have any further questions uh not at the moment i don't um i do want to thank you for taking the time out of your day i'm so excited that i finally got to talk to you and your story is amazing it's going to inspire it already has inspired so many people um in the science world and not and beyond so Thank you for what you do. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that we'd gone on so long. Um, but, um, it, you know, it, you have my contact info. And if anybody has any follow on questions, um, you know, I think there are things that you can take off no matter what you do. And, and, and one of it is to remember that uh, as a species, we work better as a team. You know, Homo sapiens means wise human. And you think about if one head is good, two heads or two brains are better. And so everything we do in that makes a difference is, is, is a team. And uh, it's all about the mission and the team. And if you can find a way to fulfill whatever your passion is, uh, invariably the success is gonna be more likely if you can work together. And even though Felix and Alan jumped us, you know, as an individual, they, they had that team behind them. And they have a, there's an old African proverb that says, if you want to go uh, fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And uh, this is our journey, and we're going to have to go together to, to get there. The Medical Muse is produced by Timothy Crow. Your hosts are Daniel Epstein and Raj Kavadi. Social media coordinator, Andre Vonderosten. Music on the show by Foxy Music. For more information, check out foxymusic.com. Join us next episode for our interview with Dr. Vivek Kavadi, Chief Radiation Oncology Officer of U.S. Oncology. Lastly, we'd love to connect with you. Follow us on Instagram at the underscore medical underscore muse. See you next time.